Hi, I'm Stephen Bauman, and in this video, we're gonna talk about one of the most boring non-entity projects that you can ever do as a representational art student. I'm talking, of course, about drawing a well-lit sphere. I just want to take a second here at the start and sell you on what this project has to offer. I get the question all the time on Instagram and in the YouTube comments section, what project do you recommend to help me improve my shading skills, my understanding of form and value? What about understanding the different stages in a drawing and how to render in graphite? The answer to all of these questions is singular and super simple. It's the Sphere Project. The subject matter is super simple and it brings together all of the skills that you need to make any highly rendered representational drawing. All the clips that you're gonna see in this video are taken from a really in-depth tutorial that I made for my Patreon subscribers. And it's available if you subscribe to the Atelier tier along with dozens of other really great in-depth lessons. For now though, I wanna to jump to the drawing lesson and show you all of the things that you can learn from this incredibly basic foundational project. If you notice, all of the line segments in this drawing at the moment are made with just about the same value. In addition to that, they have a similar width and concentration. Practicing this kind of consistency in your line application will ensure that when you're ready to apply a variety of line qualities, that that variety will be emerging out from a highly organized place. Remember that an accent, like a crisp edge or a very soft edge, is only an accent if it stands out from the rest. If there's tons of variety in all of your lines, you're going to have a chaos of variety wherein no one accent can properly stand out. Let's get back to our shadow edges. So remember we have our form shadow edge here and our cast shadow edge here. Before we move into value, I'm gonna indicate a couple of changes in the quality of these lines to indicate the character of the shadow edges they're describing. Now form shadow edges, depending upon the form that they are on, tend to be soft or transitional in nature. The more round the form that the form shadow is on, the softer it will tend to be. Now, given that the lighting situations are similar, the more round a form is, the softer the form shadow edge on it will be. And the more sharp a form turn is, the sharper that form shadow edge will be. This line represents to me a boundary strong enough to be called a line, yet different enough from a form shadow edge to show us that it's representing a different phenomenon. Let's move on then to the cast shadow edge, and I want to tell you a few particular characteristics about cast shadows. Now, a cast shadow exists in relationship to the form that's casting it. So in this instance, the form here is casting this shadow edge. The form here is casting this shadow edge. The form here is casting this shadow edge. And the form here is casting this shadow edge. I point this out because the boundary of the cast shadow edge changes in relationship to the distance it is from the form that is casting it. So here we can see a relatively short distance in between the form that is casting the shadow edge and the edge itself. Here, a moderate distance, and here, a much longer distance. So here is the principle that you need to keep in mind when you're working on your cast shadow edges. The closer a cast shadow edge is to the form that's casting it, the sharper it will be. The further a cast shadow edge is from the form that's casting it, the softer that edge will be. What I'm going to do now is indicate the differences in the character of this shadow edge as we progress from left to right, going from sharper here to softer here. Now in cast shadows, this soft edge here is referred to as a penumbra. A penumbra is a space of partial illumination in between the true shadow here and full light on the other side. This effect is caused by light rays crossing as they pass over this eclipsing edge of the form. The extent of the softness of this penumbra is dependent upon the size and shape of the light source that's lighting the form that is casting that shadow. I know it all sounds a little bit complicated just to draw a simple shadow edge, but the more that you know, the more you can see, and the more you see, the more you can express in your drawings and paintings. That brings me to the next topic I want to talk about, and that is the core shadow. Now, the core shadow is a particular phase inside a form shadow that represents a plane which is neither facing directly the light source or any secondary or ambient light sources that might be in the scene as well. That means the primary dominant light source, which hits all of the planes within the light shape, and also planes within the environment, is not touching this particular plane. And likewise, it's not being hit by any secondary sources like this plane here, which is reflecting light into the form of the sphere, which is within the shadow shape. The phenomenon this creates is a slightly darkened edge in between the light shape and the ambient light inside the shadow shape. 
By the way, ambient light in this situation or secondary light source refers to anything that isn't the primary light source. It can be a plane of the ground here that's receiving light from the light source. It could be a lamp that is on somewhere in the background of this scene that might be filtering some small amount of light into this area. The core shadow tends to represent the definitive boundary in between light and shadow, which helps us to describe the character of the form being hit by the light. Now that we've come to the cast shadow, it's time to bring up another element of visual phenomenon. Now an occlusion is a process by which something is being blocked or obscured from view. So in this sense, all shadows are a kind of occlusion. So when we apply that knowledge to the term ambient occlusion, it means a space in which the ambient light in the scene is being blocked or obscured. This tends to occur in a crevice in between two forms, like the flat plane of the ground here and the roundness of the sphere. As we get further and further underneath the sphere, the ambient light is more and more occluded, leading to a darkening of value as we get closer and closer to where the sphere touches the plane of the ground. You're also going to notice areas like this, where when we squint down, we actually cannot differentiate very well in between the value of the cast shadow and the value of the form shadow. At that point, I'm going to make the choice in my drawing to unify both of those together and lose the edge in between the two. This kind of choice and this editing out of information enhances the overall visual impression and the sense of atmosphere that we get inside the shadows. So let's talk about the light shape, let's talk about halftones, and let's talk about the Lambert value scale. In order to understand how to create the appropriate kinds of gradations to create the effect of form on a lighted surface, we need to understand what kind of value scale we're referring to. Now there are two basic kinds of value scales that we talk about. One is a linear scale, which takes even steps between 1 and 10 to go from white to black. However, that's not how light on form works. The gradation from the lightest planes to the darkest planes just before the shadow follows a non-linear value gradation, meaning that it starts out in the lightest lights, very, very unified, before steeply dropping off around the dark halftone area, which immediately precedes the core shadow edge. So this dark halftone area is not just some vague visual phenomenon that we see when we squint down, it is a measurable scientific phenomenon. And though we are not scientists, this is somewhat of an experiment here to see how much and how clearly we can express the phenomenon of light and shadow in this situation. That then is how we get from the lightest plane all the way to the core shadow edge. So then let's talk about the different parts of the light shape. In the planes which are facing most directly the light source, we have what is called the center light. After that, we have the halftones, and then leading up to the core shadow edge, we have the dark halftone area. The halftones and the center light tend to be relatively unified in relationship to each other. The dark halftone, however, when you squint down, tends to unify together with the core shadow edge, creating the effect of a very soft gradation in between light and shadow. There is, however, one more element that we're going to encounter here, and that is the specular highlight. Now, a specular highlight is a reflective highlight. And it, in fact, will move around on the surface of the form with respect to the position of the light source and the position of the viewer. In this instance, we find the specular highlight located here, in between the center light and our viewpoint. So that means, actually, the lightest point on this sphere is not actually the point that is facing most towards the light. It is the semi-reflective surface of the sphere that bounces light directly from the light source into our eye, creating the highest key, whitest light in the drawing. What you're seeing on screen right now is more or less what your drawing should look like at the end of your drawing process. And I want to talk to you now about some of the things that we learned throughout this lesson and also give you some thoughts that you can use to help push yourself forward. So on the surface, this lesson was about drawing a sphere in graphite. But in actual fact, that drawing was really made out of different elements of visual phenomenon that we need to put names on and understand the definitions of. We talked about specular highlights, we talked about the center light, we talked about mid-tone areas, dark halftones, shadow shapes, reflected light, ambient occlusions. We talked about keying the edges in your drawing. So finding the sharpest edge and the softest edge in your source image and using the relationship in between those two edges as a way to understand all of the edges taking place in your drawing. In fact, we did the same exact thing with values. We established the darkest dark and the lightest light and we used those two polar opposites in order to help us understand all the values that took place in between. In addition to that, we talked about how to see the unity in your shadows. It's a technique that when I learned it as a student, I remember thinking to myself, come on, this is too simple. But actually squinting down 
reducing the amount of light that enters your eyes when you observe your subject is the perfect way to reduce contrasts in the shadow and understand exactly how you can compress those values in your drawing. We also introduced you to the bread and butter of any. That's all for this lesson. I wanna thank you so much for spending some time and watching this video. If you found this information helpful and you want to work through this entire lesson yourself so that you can make progress in your drawing skills, just follow the link that's in the description of this video and it will take you directly to my Patreon page. By subscribing to the Atelier tier, you'll get access to dozens of lessons that are produced with no other intent than to help you get better at drawing in the most efficient way possible. That's all for today. Once again, I'm Stephen Bauman, and I'll see you in the next video.